Buckle up, space fans, because today we're taking a deep dive into the Galileo mission. We're talking Jupiter, its moons, and how a team of brilliant minds back in the 70s and 80s pulled off one of the most ambitious space missions of all time. It's really amazing when you think about it. Galileo wasn't just a flyby. This was humanity's first chance to put a spacecraft into orbit around Jupiter, a truly groundbreaking endeavor. And the challenges they faced getting this mission off the ground were immense. So take us back to the drawing board. What were some of the biggest obstacles they had to overcome? Well, for starters, just getting a probe into Jupiter's atmosphere was a huge hurdle. We're talking about an environment unlike anything we have on Earth. The atmospheric pressure, the heat, the technology to design a heat shield that could withstand that kind of descent didn't even exist. So they were basically writing the instruction manual as they went along. In a way, yes. They had to get creative, draw on whatever data they could get their hands on. The Pioneer 10 flyby in 73 had given them some crucial information about the radiation levels around Jupiter. Which were initially thought to be a major showstopper, right? Exactly. But Pioneer showed that while intense, the radiation wasn't an immediate death sentence for a spacecraft. So that was a huge relief. Okay, so the radiation's manageable. But now there's the small matter of actually getting to Jupiter. Right, and that's where the debate started. A direct flight to Jupiter versus a longer journey using gravity assists from other planets. Ah, uh, yes, the gravitational slingshot. Always makes me think of a cosmic game of billiards. It's an elegant solution, but it comes at the cost of time. Yeah. Instead of a quick trip. Yeah. We're talking years added to the mission. Which means more wear and tear on the spacecraft. More risk. What did they decide on? They went for efficiency. Initially, they were planning to use a three-stage inertial upper stage, or IUS, for the launch. But to give the spacecraft a fighting chance in Jupiter's harsh environment, they decided on a vented atmospheric probe instead of a pressurized one. Okay, so explain it to me like I'm five. Why is a vented probe such a big deal? Think of it this way. A vented probe equalizes its internal pressure with the outside environment as it descends. In Jupiter's atmosphere, that's crucial. Otherwise, the probe would be crushed like a tin can. Smart. But I'm guessing that change didn't come without its own set of challenges. You're right. The vented probe design added weight. And in spaceflight, weight equals complexity. Suddenly, launching everything in one go was starting to seem less feasible. So what was the plan B? They started exploring a two-launch scenario. Set up the orbiter first, then a month later launched the probe on a separate mission to rendezvous at Jupiter. A two-part cosmic dance. I bet that got complicated. It would have been a complex maneuver for sure. And much more expensive, of course. Because as always, it comes down to budget, right? Sadly, yes. And just when they thought they had a solution, tragedy struck. The Challenger disaster in 1986 changed everything. The Challenger disaster was a dark day for space exploration. I can only imagine the impact it had on a mission as complex as Galileo. It was a huge setback. The Centaur rocket, which had been a contender for launching Galileo in one go, was suddenly off the table. They were back to square one. This is where the suspense really starts to build. How did they recover from that? They did recover. And the way they did is a testament to the ingenuity of these engineers. Remember Robert Mitchell, the mission design manager. He was the one who refused to let Galileo become a museum piece. He and his team went back to the drawing board and they came up with a truly audacious plan. The VEGA trajectory. VDA. Sounds like something out of Star Trek. It kind of does, right? VEA stands for Venus Earth, Earth Gravity Assist. Instead of flying directly to Jupiter, they would use the gravity of Venus and Earth, not once, but twice, to slingshot Galileo out towards its destination. So they're playing cosmic pinball to get to Jupiter? Essentially, yes. It was a brilliant solution, but it meant adding years to the mission. And I'm guessing that wasn't the only challenge they faced during that time. You're right. As they were gearing up for the launch, public concern about the mission's plutonium-powered generators started to grow. Right. The plutonium. That was a major point of contention. Which is a huge issue. People were understandably concerned about the risk of an accident during launch. Yeah. Those GPHS RTG modules. They were essential to power the spacecraft on its long journey to Jupiter. But they also carried a certain amount of risk. It's a tough one. On the one hand, you have the drive to explore the universe. And on the other, you have a responsibility to protect our own planet. It was a complex ethical debate. And there were valid points on both sides. Even Carl Sagan, who was a huge proponent of space exploration, acknowledged the difficult nature of the situation. So how did it play out? In the end, the courts ruled in favor of NASA. Mm -hmm. And Galileo was cleared for launch. 
But the controversy surrounding the plutonium highlighted a very important aspect of space exploration. Which is? It's not just about scientific advancement. It's also about carefully considering the risks involved mm. and engaging with the public's concerns. It's a good reminder that even when we're reaching for the stars, we still have a responsibility to our own planet. Absolutely. Yeah. And as if the plutonium controversy wasn't enough, just as Galileo was launched, they hit another snag, this time a technical one. Uh-oh. What happened? The high-gain antenna, the one they needed to send back all that precious data from Jupiter, it malfunctioned. Some of its ribs got stuck during deployment. Stuck? You're kidding. They designed this thing to travel millions of miles through space, and the antenna gets stuck. It just goes to show, even with the best engineering, Space is an unforgiving environment. The team tried everything to free the antenna. They heated it up. They cooled it down. They even tried shaking the entire spacecraft. I can only imagine the tension back in mission control. It must have been like something out of a movie. Eventually, they figured out what caused the malfunction. And get this. It was a cost-cutting measure that came back to bite them. You're kidding me. Cost-cutting on a billion-dollar spacecraft. It seems crazy, right? But to save money. They decided to transport the spacecraft across the country by truck instead of flying it. And all those vibrations during the road trip, combined with the forces of launch, caused the lubricant in the antenna mechanism to erode. And that's what caused the ribs to jam. So let me guess. The mission was over. Not quite. This is where the ingenuity of the Galileo team really shines. They managed to work around the antenna issue and gather some truly incredible data from Jupiter. I on the edge of my seat. Tell me everything. Okay, so last time we left Galileo hurtling towards Jupiter with a busted antenna, talk about a cliffhanger. It's a good thing they don't write space missions like they do TV shows, because despite that setback, Galileo managed to send back some truly remarkable data. So let's get right to it. What did Galileo teach us about the king of planets? Well, first imagine this. A tiny probe braving the extreme pressure and heat of Jupiter's atmosphere, battling winds stronger than anything we've ever seen on Earth. It's hard to even imagine. And the data it sent back was just as mind-blowing. For example, it turns out Jupiter has a lot more nitrogen, carbon, and sulfur than we thought. Oh. Which tells us what? What does that tell us? It suggests that Jupiter might have swallowed up a lot of smaller celestial objects in its early days. Like a cosmic vacuum cleaner? Exactly. And here's another curveball. They found an abundance of noble gases, argon, xenon, in quantities far greater than what we see in the sun. Now, I'm no astronomer, but isn't that kind of a big deal? It completely upends our understanding of how gas giants like Jupiter form. It means there are still pieces missing from the puzzle. I love it. The universe is full of surprises. And speaking of surprises, what about Jupiter's moons? Ah, yes. The Jovian moons. Galileo showed us that they're more than just chunks of rock and ice. They're unique worlds in their own right. Like, for instance? Take Io, the most volcanically active body in our solar system. We're talking volcanoes erupting constantly, spewing lava into space. In Europa. Europa is even more intriguing. Galileo confirmed the presence of a vast saltwater ocean beneath its icy surface. Whoa, you're saying there could be life down there. It's definitely a possibility. And then there's Ganymede, the largest moon in the solar system. Galileo discovered that Ganymede has its own magnetic field, the first moon ever found to have one. Okay, now that's just showing off. And as if that wasn't enough, it turns out that Ganymede, along with Europa and Callisto, has a thin atmosphere. Amazing. Galileo really opened our eyes to the wonders of the Jovian system. It did indeed. And it paved the way for future missions like Juno and Ju-IC, which are continuing to explore Jupiter and its moons. It's incredible to think that even with all the challenges it faced, the Galileo mission revolutionized our understanding of this part of the cosmos. It's a testament to the power of human ingenuity and our endless curiosity about the universe. And on that note, we come to the end of our deep dive into the Galileo mission. But before we go, I have one final question for our listeners. If you could send a message out to those distant moons, to a potential civilization that might be listening, what would you say? Let us know. And until next time, keep exploring.